Hello and welcome to this special edition of Reporters. I'm Sue Lloyd Roberts. This week we report from the southern African country of Botswana, where over the last eight years the government have been moving the Bushmen from their traditional home in the central Kalahari game reserve. Only a couple of hundred Bushmen are left in the land they've inhabited as hunters and gatherers for tens of thousands of years. Before the last Bushmen are forced to leave, we went to try and find out why. Champions of a unique way of life whose ancient hunting and gathering traditions should be protected, or outdated Stone Age creatures, as the president of Botswana has called them, who should be made to get real. The different views on the Bushmen of the Kalahari are as contradictory as the different images of modern Botswana. If, if, if everybody must continue to do what they used to do, then we, we can't develop, we can't talk of development. Let them call us primitive, let them call us Stone Age people, but our way of life suits us. We have seen their development and we don't like it. Botswana has the fastest growing economy in Africa. Now the world's leading producer of diamonds the precious stones account for half of government revenue and the promise of free education for all. The Bushmen are believed to be among the first inhabitants of Africa. There's evidence of their life in the Kalahari some 30,000 years ago. Their right to live in the area, now known as the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, was enshrined in Botswana's constitution at independence 40 years ago and is now being withdrawn by the government. The president himself calls the Bushmen, or Basara as they're known here, prehistoric creatures who, he says, like the dodo, face extinction unless they move on. And in the last few years, the government have been moving them on and out of their ancestral lands. Ten years ago, there were only a few thousand Bushmen left living in the reserve Three years ago, they tell you how those remaining were rounded up and brutally relocated to settlements like Kaudwani on the edge of the reserve from where they've been told they can't enter without a permit and they're forbidden to hunt. Even 60-year-old men have recently been punished for disobedience. They suspended my legs in the air by tying me to a bull bar like this. Then they beat me and stamped on my fingers until I confessed that I had stolen an antelope. They grabbed my testicles and pulled so I had blood in my urine for days afterwards. We've been beaten, tortured and taken to court for hunting Eland. Why? Why can't we hunt in our own land? like we have for thousands of years. We will not allow them to hunt in the park. We must have, this country must continue to have some place where you could say, no, this, are, this is wildlife which was abundant in this country before. Otherwise, there will be nothing. From the settlement at Kadwani, we drove into the heart of the reserve. More than 200 Bushmen have defied the government and moved back. Many to the village of Metsiamanon. Although recent reports show that in fact game has increased in the reserve while the Bushmen were still living here, the government gives another argument for their removal. That the Bushmen can only get the development they so badly need outside the reserve. The Bushmen say they are developing. They still hunt and gather like their ancestors, and now they grow melons and herd goats to help provide for themselves. There used to be a school and clinic in the reserve, but the government closed them and then concreted over the waterhole. It was, they believe, part of a deliberate policy to change them and then move them. 
When I was young, the men hunted and we got our water from the roots of plants. We lived well and people only died of old age, not of diseases. But then government officials started bringing us water and mealy meal. They kept bringing these things. And now that I think about it, I believe it was to make us dependent and abandon our traditional ways and get us to move. They just came and grabbed people and pulled down the huts. They said my children had to go to school in the new settlements. My children were shouting and screaming as they took them away. I beg the government to let my children come back and live with me. We drove for a day and out of the reserve to the resettlement camp at Mukade. It's a journey only possible in a four-wheel drive. There is no other means of transport. Mrs. Moti asked us to look out for her children there. Nukade has a school, a clinic, and a fair display of modern concrete buildings. But the Bushmen tell you, it's the government officials who live in the new houses. They live in traditional huts. None of them have jobs in the running of the settlement, and there's little to do but sit around drinking. We found Mrs. Moti's son with friends outside the Cool Way Bar. He appeared to be enjoying himself and the president might be pleased to see him behaving and dressing like a modern teenager. He said our news of his mother was the first that he'd heard that she was still alive. But surely life is better for him here. Really, I want to go to, to my mother's village, my homeland, because actually this, all these bars and all these facilities, I think they are nothing in my life. The, you know, the most what I value is the dignity, the dignity of human being, human dignity. My land is my dignity. We found some more children of the reserve behind a wire fence at the hostel where they live after school hours. Because I have to attend school. This little girl said she was missing her mother who was back in the reserve. The men spend what is left of their compensation money in the bars, leaving the women to bemoan their fate. The government promised us lots of things. Cattle, land, houses, jobs for the young people. We have been here four years now and we've received nothing. Alcohol has become a big problem for our people. We want to go home before we all die. We are getting new diseases like AIDS, which we never saw before. Now, here in Nukade, people are dying of alcohol and AIDS. In fact, it is a good settlement. All the people who said that they, these people should go back are people who have come from outside. The people of Kade were persuaded. We took 15 years to do it, to persuade them. But now they find that they, they actually say they, they didn't want to, they like to stay in Kadi. Two years ago, the Bushmen decided to fight back and to take the government to court to claim their right to return to the reserve. Last year, their case opened at the High Court. Toshkodizo Bazalwani testified on behalf of his people. <laughs> I tell the court that we don't want to move from here because this land is ours. But government officials came to the settlements and told us that we all had to move because the mines were coming. We say if the mines come here, then we see no problem living here alongside them and our children can work there. The idea that diamond mining could account for the removal of the Bushmen has led to protest against the Botswana government and the companies they do business with. Boycott the beers! Boycott the exhibition! The campaigning group, Survival International, have organized a number of demonstrations, including this one outside the current diamonds exhibition, sponsored by De Beers, 
at London's Natural History Museum. Survival and their supporters claim that diamonds are behind the relocation of the Bushmen. De Beers deny the connection. They've, they've got enough um, at stake to say that something like that. What do you expect uh, corporations to say? De Beers told us they did not want to be interviewed and that the debate had been going on long enough. There's plenty of exploration going on in the central Kalahari game reserve today. Even though officially no one's supposed to be living here, we found warnings of the regular low-level flights carrying out geological surveys, searching for diamonds. Although mining hasn't started in the reserve yet, dozens of new concessions have been sold throughout Botswana, not least within the reserve itself, where there were only a few before the latest eviction of Bushmen. But after a further thousand or so were removed, there was a sharp rise in the number of concessions sold to diamond mining giants like BHP Billiton and De Beers. Dr. John Gurney, professor of geology at Cape Town University, was one of the team who discovered diamonds in the reserve back in the 1980s. He remembers how, while examining the soil, one sample of kimberlite stood out. As the results came off the electron microprobe, which is the instrument that I use to analyze these things, I was putting stars on these things because they were just the compositions that we wanted to see. So do you think diamond mining will ever take place in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve? People will continue to look. Well, I think if somebody found Juaneng in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, it would be hard for Botswana to r rationalize that it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be mined. I mean, the reason that everybody's looking frantically is that there's a shortage of supply of diamonds in the world at the moment, and there's a predicted shortage for the next 25 years. The diamond industry is the most important in the country, accounting for 80% of foreign revenue, and nothing stands in the way of the diggers once a potential mine has been located. The giant Zhuaneng mine in the south of the country is now the richest in the world and has produced some of the finest diamonds. It's joined, owned by the government and De Beers under the company Debswana. Hundreds of locals were moved to accommodate it. The government makes no apology for its declared policy that citizens have to give way for developments of national importance. The day we discover diamonds anywhere in the country, including in the game reserve, we will not hesitate to develop them. We will not apologize either to the BBC or to anybody. It's our country. We have to leave, including the Bushmen. They have to leave. Therefore, we would mine. But the president insists that the recent relocation of Bushmen is nothing to do with diamonds. It's to protect the wildlife and develop them. But some Bushmen leaders disagree. There were public meetings, and I and many others heard it when the Minister for Minerals and the Minister for Local Government told us, back in the 1980s, that we were to be moved because of the mining. It's because of the mines that the people have been moved. The government just don't like to admit it now because of the bad publicity. The minister responsible for the relocation turned down our request for an interview. What do Deb Swana say about the Bushman's claim? I cannot answer for the politicians. Uh, you know, the way they, they, they answer and, 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 and act at different times in their careers, I cannot answer for that. But as you know, as Deb Swana or the beers, there's no money taking place at, at Hope right now. I cannot deny the fact there are diamonds there, and if the diamonds become economic one, they will probably mine them. But mining itself will not, is not responsible for the moving people from the CKGR. And if you claim in Botswana today that mining could be the reason for moving the Bushmen out of the Kalahari, you can get into trouble. Now living in exile in North London, Ken Good, Botswana University's professor of political science, was thrown out of the country by President Mohai a few weeks ago. In an academic paper he had written of the intimate connection between the expulsion of the Bushmen and mining explorations. Why? In the future, um, 
courts might find in favour of Bushmen in Botswana and their rights to land and to diamonds. He was accused of being in cahoots with Survival International and a threat to national security and to diamond sales. How could my paper affect profits down the line from diamonds production? Please, Mr. President, explain. Why was he told to leave? He's a rogue and a vagabond. He's not a gentleman. Above all, the case is still going on, therefore I am not allowed to elaborate on that. But I don't apologize for what you call After all, he's a fourth-rate intellectual who has never written any objective, has not published anything except express opinions on Botswana. And therefore, I don't apologize for that. But I'm determined to keep him out of this country. But why should the government be worried about the speculation of an academic or even the presence of Bushmen living in an area potentially rich in diamonds when the government owns the rights to all minerals found in the country anyway. I left the reserve to explore a possible answer to this mystery several hundred miles to the southwest in South Africa. The journey takes you the breadth of the Kalahari Desert as it straddles the countries of southern Africa passing the Richtersveld National Park to the Atlantic coast. It is here that rich diamond reserves are to be found on either side of the Orange River, which marks the border between South Africa and Namibia. Diamonds were first discovered here in Alexandra Bay back in the 1920s. The indigenous Nama people were moved away from the fertile coastal plains inland to the inhospitable Richtersveld. We arrived at a weekend when work takes a break, but over the last 78 years, the mine has yielded some $2 billion worth of diamonds. During that period, the Nama were denied access to some 85,000 hectares of farming land, fishing resources and wetlands now polluted by the discharge from the mine. But despair over the loss and damage to ancestral lands has turned into expectation of huge diamond wealth. Today, the community is cock-a-hoop. Last year, the Constitutional Court of South Africa agreed the principle of their claim for damages as the descendants of the Nama who were displaced. They go back to court soon to work out the rewards. Gemeenskap is wat die wat die teruggawe van die grond wat ontneem is. We're asking for 200 million dollars compensation for the loss of the land. Uh, 15 million dollars for our share of the diamonds already extracted and one and a half million dollars for the pain and suffering. And firm in the belief that the Lord is on their side, some two and a half thousand Nama people are expecting a handsome settlement and their lawyers are confident they'll get it. In fact, their lawyers have already been contacted by another indigenous group in South Africa with a similar claim. Following the success of these people, the Namas who live across the border in Namibia are investigating whether they too might have a claim against their government's joint venture company with De Beers. Further afield in Canada, the Inuit and Cree people have fought for land rights and won. In Australia, Rio Tinto Zinc has bowed down to pressure from Aboriginals and withdrawn mining operations. And in Botswana, if the Bushmen can return to their land, then they too could claim the right of consultation and even remuneration for any diamond mining that takes place there. But for the moment, here at the High Court in Botswana, they're still fighting that first battle for the right to return to their land. The case between the Bushmen and the government is due to resume here shortly. The Bushmen don't think they have much of a chance of winning, nor indeed that they'll have the funds to see the case through to its conclusion. But if they lose, their lawyer believes they could win in a court of appeal, 
which in Botswana would be before a bench of Commonwealth judges sympathetic to the rights of first occupants. I think there is a broad recognition now that uh, those who are in first occupation of land uh, are entitled to recognition of uh, the rights arising by dint of that occupation. It's a recognition which is, uh, I think, now found in many Commonwealth countries, including Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and now South Africa. And it's also a principle which is much more widely recognised than it used to be now in international law. There are a number of international treaties and conventions in which the rights of indigenous peoples are uh, firmly acknowledged. Uh, and I would hope that uh, Botswana will want to join uh, that school of thought and accept uh, uh, that those who are in first occupation of land ought to have their rights recognised. To date, the Bushmen have made no claim to the mineral wealth of their land. All they want is to remain in one of the most inhospitable places on earth, a place where no one else wants to live. I was born here, I was brought up here, and I say no, no, no to relocation. I want them to bring my children back so that they can bury me here with my ancestors in my ancestral land. The children of the reserve are unlikely to be allowed to return. At the current rate of relocation, it could be that there are no Bushmen left in the reserve before the truth about their removal is known and all possible legal avenues explored. The Bushmen of the Kalahari and their supporters argue that the situation is too urgent to wait. Unless the present policy is reversed, the last remnant on earth of a unique way of life will disappear forever. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Reporters. I'm Sue Lloyd-Roberts. This week we report from the southern African country of Botswana, where over the last eight years the government have been moving the Bushmen from their traditional home in the central Kalahari game reserve. Only a couple of hundred Bushmen are left in the land they've inhabited as hunters and gatherers for tens of thousands of years. Before the last Bushmen are forced to leave, we went to try and find out why. Champions of a unique way of life whose ancient hunting and gathering traditions should be protected, or outdated Stone Age creatures, as the president of Botswana has called them who should be made to get real. The different views on the Bushmen of the Kalahari are as contradictory as the different images of modern Botswana. If, if, if everybody must continue to do what they used to do, then we, we can't develop, we can't talk of development. Let them call us primitive, let them call us Stone Age people. But our way of life suits us. We have seen their development and we don't like it. Botswana has the fastest growing economy in Africa. Now the world's leading producer of diamonds, the precious stones account for half of government revenue and the promise of free education for all. The Bushmen are believed to be among the first inhabitants of Africa. There's evidence of their life in the Kalahari some 30,000 years ago. 
Their right to live in the area, now known as the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, was enshrined in Botswana's constitution at independence 40 years ago and is now being withdrawn by the government. The president himself calls the Bushmen, or Basara as they're known here, prehistoric creatures who, he says, like the dodo, face extinction unless they move on. And in the last few years, the government have been moving them on and out of their ancestral lands. Ten years ago, there were only a few thousand Bushmen left living in the reserve. Three years ago, they tell you how those remaining were rounded up and brutally relocated to settlements like Kaudwani on the edge of the reserve from where they've been told they can't enter without a permit and they're forbidden to hunt. Even 60-year-old men have recently been punished for disobedience. They suspended my legs in the air by tying me to a bull bar like this. Then they beat me and stamped on my fingers until I confessed that I had stolen an antelope. They grabbed my testicles and pulled so I had... It's better for him here. Really, I want to go to, to my mother's village, my homeland, because actually this, all these bars and all these facilities, I think they are nothing in my life. The, you know, the most what I value is the dignity, the dignity of human being, human dignity. My land is my dignity. We found some more children of the reserve behind a wire fence at the hostel where they live after school hours. Because I have to attend school. This little girl said she was missing her mother who was back in the reserve. The men spend what is left of their compensation money in the bars, leaving the women to bemoan their fate. The government promised us lots of things. Cattle, land, houses, jobs for the young people. We have been here four years now and we've received nothing. Alcohol has become a big problem for our people. We want to go home before we all die. We are getting new diseases like AIDS, which we never saw before. Now, here in Nukade, people are dying of alcohol and AIDS. In fact, it is a good settlement. All the people who said that they, these people should go back are people who have come from outside. The people of Tade were persuaded. We took 15 years to do it, to persuade them. But now they find that they, they actually say they, they didn't want to... They lived well and people only died of old age, not of diseases. But then government officials started bringing us water and mealy meal. They kept bringing these things. And now that I think about it, I believe it was to make us dependent and abandon our traditional ways and get us to move. <laughs> They just came and grabbed people and pulled down the huts. They said my children had to go to school in the new settlements. My children were shouting and screaming as they took them away. I begged the government to let my children come back and live with me. We drove for a day and out of the reserve to the resettlement camp at Nukade. It's a journey only possible in a four-wheel drive. There is no other means of transport. Mrs. Moti asked us to look out for her children there. Nukade has a school, a clinic, and a fair display of modern concrete buildings. But the Bushmen tell you, it's the government officials who live in the new houses they live in traditional huts, none of them have jobs in the running of the settlement, and there's little to do but sit around drinking. We found Mrs. Moti's son with friends outside the Cool Way Bar. He appeared to be enjoying himself, and the president might be pleased to see him behaving and dressing like a modern teenager. He said our news of his mother was the first that he'd heard that she was still alive. But surely life... Blood in my urine for days afterwards. 
We've been beaten, tortured and taken to court for hunting eland. Why? Why can't we hunt in our own land like we have for thousands of years? We will not allow them to hunt in the park. We must have, this country must continue to have some place where you could say, no, this, are, this is wildlife which was abundant in this country before. Otherwise, there will be nothing. From the settlement at Kadwani, we drove into the heart of the reserve. More than 200 Bushmen have defied the government and moved back. Many to the village of Metsiamanon. Although recent reports show that in fact game has increased in the reserve while the Bushmen were still living here, the government gives another argument for their removal, that the Bushmen can only get the development they so badly need outside the reserve. The Bushmen say they are developing. They still hunt and gather like their ancestors, and now they grow melons and herd goats to help provide for themselves. There used to be a school and clinic in the reserve, but the government closed them and then concreted over the waterhole. It was, they believe, part of a deliberate policy to change them and then move them. When I was young, the men hunted and we got our water from the roots of plants. We